For our final conversation of the day, please welcome back Semaphore Editor-at-Large, Steve Clemens, to facilitate a dialogue on Ukraine's economic future. Jason, come here, come here, come here. We're gonna do this a little differently. I just wanna say a public thank you to Jason Furman, who was not given enough credit for being the first person to sign on to be co-chair of this, this economic summit. It's turned out great. Thank you, he took a risk on us. So thank you so much. Wow. Really appreciate it. No, I just it's want to thank. A great event. Yeah, no, I mean, I just, yeah, don't, don't, you know, t it, it, when you get this praise, take it. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Oksana Markarova, please join me up here. Um, and I'm going to say when Ambassador Mike Froman comes in, bring up a chair uh, when he arrives. <laughs> Ambassador, good. I, I would hug you, but let's just be very uh, formal. But I would give her a big hug because I love her. Um, anyway, the. Uh, Mike Froman, who is the vice chairman of MasterCard, many of you may have read recently, he's the incoming president of the Council on Foreign Relations, will be joining us. MasterCard is having a major four-day expose on inclusivity uh, and diversity in the global economy. And so their programs are going on while it's going on, so it's great. We've been, I've been going to their stuff, they've been coming to my, when I haven't been on stage, I've been over there, no, I'm just joking, I've been here all day. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's gonna come over and join us, and then we're gonna have this great reception. But right here, you know, I asked Oksana Markarova, whom I've gotten to know, to take off her ambassador hat and to put on her minister, previous minister of finance hat. And to talk to us a little bit, if you can imagine a world where Ukraine is post-conflict, we don't know how we're gonna get there, what it's gonna look like, but there's been a lot of debate about the solvency, um, the legitimacy, um, the levels of corruption in the Ukrainian economy. It's been a big topic in Davos, big topic in this town, and I would just love to give you an opportunity, Ambassador, Minister, um, to share your thoughts on that discussion. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for paying attention to Ukraine. And this is the most exciting topic actually to discuss about. What are we going to do after we win? How Ukraine will look like? What is it that we're trying to build? And we're doing it now while we fight on the front lines. There is a lot of efforts that already been done by the government. And there is, I want to go back a little bit before this phase of the war, before the full-fledged war started, because a lot of the success during these 13 months, not only on the battlefield, but the fact that the country was able to operate, that public finances, although damaged, uh, continue to, 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 to operate in the country, that government everywhere, except for the occupied areas, of course, by Russians, but even in the newly liberated areas, how quickly the government comes back, that the banking system still operates mm. in the full-fledged, uh, phase of the war, that businesses are paying taxes and Minister of Finance, uh, the current Minister of Finance is in, the, in town, of course, for the IMF World Bank meetings, sharing how we're losing more than 30% of the revenue, of the, of the uh, output. We actually are collecting this year almost the same amount of revenue. So why is it possible? What is the, the reason for that miracle? And actually the result is in the eight years of reforms that Ukraine has been going through since 2014. So this macroeconomic stability, the really real fight with corruption, So in a eliminate... time of war, in a time of national crisis, your companies are paying taxes. Yes. And your individual, do you have an IRS? Of course, it's called the tax administration. And interesting, and so, and your, your uh, Minister of Finance, your Prime Minister is here. Yes. Um, last night we had dinner with um, Scott Nathan, the head of the international um, US uh, uh, defense. DFC. Yeah, DFC, well, Development Finance Corporation. Corporation. It's working there. They, you, you saw it. He didn't tell us what, but he signed a big deal with the Prime Minister today, as I understand, in an MOU. Yep. What is the DFC financing in Ukraine? They continue, not only continue, but increase their funding, their political risk insurances, which also include a wider range of risks that will be covered. They funded one of the Ukrainian banks this year. They're looking on some other banks. Uh, they are looking for opportunities, and opportunities are there, again, in the full-fledged type of war. Uh, so, you know, what is it that we are trying to build there? Hmm. We think that after we win, and we are doing the reforms this year, and Greco just a couple of weeks ago published the, their um, analysis, annual analysis of the anti-corruption reforms, and Ukraine is one of the very few countries 
which increased in the rating. And they even cited that we've done more reforms during this last year, believe it or not, during the war time right. than before previous years. Right. So um, we are building Ukraine 2.0, something more innovative. When uh, Russians have destroyed more than 50% of the energy infrastructure, they have de not destroyed completely, but damaged significantly. When some cities like Mariupol, like Kherson, like uh, uh, Kharkiv are nearly, you know, half destroyed. How, like are, you or how are you quickly replacing that destroyed infrastructure? Uh, it's, um, first of all, we differentiate between the massive renovation that will happen, of course, after we win and there is peace. Uh, but the, also the rapid recovery, which we are doing right now. So we survived this winter. Mm. This winter, a lot of people thought that it uh, would be impossible to survive with constant attacks, orchestrated missiles attack on the infrastructure. So, of course, we have to say thank you to all of our partners, especially the U.S., you know, the energy coalition platform, uh, finding transformers in unbelievable places, replacing the destroyed infrastructure, putting the air defense, which US and other partners are providing to secure it. But also we are moving into more decentralized energy grid, you know, something that was inefficient even before the war, even before the war started in 2014. When it works, even if it's inefficient, you rarely destroy it in order to build something really good. Mm. Well, Russians have destroyed it for us, you know, unfortunately. Right. So when we are putting it together, we already are thinking how to leapfrog into something more innovative, to use what is out there that we mm. can put, not just rebuild what it was before, but build something new. Now, that will require massive mobilization of the private capital and attracting investors. So on the basis of this um, foundation that we have, sustainability, resiliency, of course, security is a very important part. I'm a realist. I understand that for companies to massively not only look at Ukraine, but come to Ukraine, we need peace. We need security guarantees. But the war risk insurance and some companies that already work in Ukraine, for example, Boeing, they're a good example, increased their R&D office in Ukraine during the past 13 months. So one of the people watching um, this segment right now is our mutual good friend, Philippe Etienne. Philippe Etienne was the uh, uh, just uh, departed French ambassador to the United States. He's up at Columbia University right now, and I think he's watching on C-SPAN. Hello, C-SPAN. Hello, Philippe. And you may remember we were at Philippe's house, and we were talking, and I had just come back from the World Economic Forum in Davos, and, and I had told you that the that the whispers that were going on at off the record dinners, so I can't, you're, well, on background dinners, so I can refer to a said but not attribute, you know, who said it, was that, you know, Ukraine's really a corrupt place. Um, Ukraine, if it were part of Europe, would be the worst performing economy. And I shared that with you. Mm -hmm. And you had very incisive, very um, um, strong words to share that were a counter view. I'd love to give you an opportunity <laughs> to respond to those unnamed individuals. Well, I'll, you know. I'll try to be less aggressive than I was when I responded. Yeah, no, was, I, I'd like you to be more, <laughs> you know. But uh, first, I mean, um, uh, no country is completely free of corruption, mismanagement, or, you know, unfortunately, where humans are, you, 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 you have that. The question is, is it systemic? Are you serious in fighting with it? Before 2013, and I was in business in Ukraine then, I was in private equity, so I know how it was it during Yanukovych times and before. So before Revolution of Dignity and before 2013, corruption in Ukraine unfortunately was systemic and fight with it was episodic. The situation completely changed after the past eight years of reforms, since 2014. So, um, the, 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 first of all, we decrease the space for corruption. The big, as we said, the presidential corruption, government to government on oil and gas, is no longer there. Mm. The deregulation in the oil and gas sector, clean up in Naftogaz, our largest uh, uh, gas trading company in the gas production, when the corruption is not started from the top and definitely is not uh, between the two presidents as it used to be before 2013, meaning Ukrainian and Russian president, that was the big area of the corruption. It's mm. no longer there. The public procurement, you know, we have adopted the Prozoro, a revolutionary, uh, transparent, and publicly available system of uh, procurement where a number of companies 
now can in, participate in the, in the procurement. That was another big part of the corruption. When I was the Minister of Finance, I started what we called e-data. We opened all the public finance data. So literally, you could see next day online who spent on what everywhere in the country. That put additional uh, scrutiny on how you, and, and we can go on and on and on, the uh, massive deregulation, uh, the, uh, the privatization, corporatization, putting put in the corporate governance standards. Now, is it ideal? Definitely not. It's a work in progress. Also judiciary, something when people spoke about corruption in Ukraine, they would always talk about the lack of free and fair judiciary. But the number of reforms since 2014, and especially during this war year, uh, has been also impressive. You know, we are restarting the, the both commissions in Ukraine. One is responsible, if I were to say in, in, in human words, for hiring judges and for firing judges. So the, we're doing it with the help of the international experts. Uh, their voice is decisive in the selection uh, process. Now, again, is it going to generate ideal solutions? No. Even in the countries with good uh, uh, situation in these areas, it requires constant work. But we are definitely on the right path. So um, we definitely have zero tolerance to corruption mm. from President Zelensky, who you see reacts to every case and you know, is very strong together with Prime Minister on dismissing people even on the uh, you know, suspicion of corruption. Maybe not all these people will be found, found guilty, but we cannot afford even a hint of that. Mm. The inspector generals who recently were both, three, not both, three of them, uh, from uh, Department of State, Pentagon and USAID, who have been in Ukraine and they are checking all the international aid, have clearly reported a number of times that they did not find any signs of any mismanagement of the foreign aid. But most importantly, this is what Ukrainian people now demand. You know, this, this is really, even contrary to 2014, 2015, we are at war. Our lives depend on us being able to use every hryvnia and every dollar and every euro, especially those that we receive from our partners, to the most effective and efficient way. So to engage in corruption these days is treason, you know. So I'm, again, it's still a r long road. But I'm positive that companies that work in Ukraine today and companies that are looking at Ukraine now will see a drastic difference. How complicated is it? I don't ask, want to ask this um, question facetiously, but you know, it, it's kind of like when I was talking to the Minister of Finance of mm -hmm. Rwanda. I said, you know, when you, you go poll most Americans about Rwanda, what came to mind, Paul Recess Begin in Hotel Rwanda, that's what they know, because they don't know all the data. So now that that is resolved, you can move into other stories. For many Americans about Ukraine, they may not know all the dimensions of the Russian invasion, et cetera. They know a little bit about Hunter Biden, they know about Burisma, they know about Rudy Giuliani, they know about shenanigans, all of this. How distracting does all of that been as you've tried to deliver a message, a more forward, positive message of the stress of Ukraine right now? Has the, has the Hunter Biden stuff been a problem for you? Look, it depends on, on who you talk to. So if you talk to um, business community, clearly they have much better understanding about Ukraine. They know more about Ukraine. And when Ukraine is on the focus or we were able to put it on the focus, uh, people read and, 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 and see more information. If you talk to ordinary people, the support of Ukraine have been enormous. And of course, I mean, the massive Russian propaganda, which was not only in Ukraine, but everywhere and in the West, not only during the wartime, not only during the past nine years, but also before that, since we regained our independence in 1991, Russia, who saw it always as the biggest problem for them, that the solution of the Soviet Union is the biggest problem, mm. they started putting out always narratives about us as a failed state, of course, we are the most corrupt, of course, we are, you know, again, not to say that part of that was not true, but look, you know, we had a fraction of Russian corruption always. And now when we see how, uh, you know, in the, in the army supplies, how incapable the army is, they, God bless Russian corruption, of course, at this stage, mm. but, but uh, you know, the fraction of their corruption was a part of our corruption. But you never heard about Russian right. corruption. Right. Even though now when we arrest all this, uh, 
unbelievable amounts of money which belonged to some even uh, low-grade public servants from Russia, somewhere right. in outside of Russia, it's clearly how, how widespread corruption is there, but you never heard about it. So right. again, part was the real problem, part was that problem was amplified and increased by the Russian propaganda, trying to, to decrease our ability even to, to generate support. And I think these 13 months have opened people's eyes that it's not only that we can fight like we fight, we actually are much better in a number of things, and now we have a window of opportunity to tell the world about it. This morning I interviewed uh, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, and um, he shared something. I need to go listen to the tape, and I gotta tell you guys, honestly, if you've been here all day, my head's lettuce now. I don't remember exactly what was said, but I seem to hear Brad say that Microsoft observed Russia engaging in some of these gaming sites and unusual sites and seeing mention of documentation coming up and that Microsoft may have notified authorities it deals with. In other words, the classified, highly classified papers, you know, Pentagon documents that have come forward um, that disclose uh, equities in the military side in Ukraine that, that show that we were quite aware of what Ukrainian officials were saying, what Russians were saying, et cetera, may have been out there and Microsoft was there. What is your view on that, um, on that intelligence being leaked and does it look to you like a Russian operation? Well, first of all, we have to be very careful with anything that comes out of Russia. So um, again, but this came it, out of the Pentagon. Whether it, no, yeah. it actually came out of Russia. Now, oh. whether it oh. came out from somewhere else where it was manufactured or it was leaked, and and then manuf uh, you know, we'll wait for the official reports, and when we hear what what happened or whether it happened, or we'll know it. But it came out from Russia. So everything that Russia is putting out there is an informational operation, by definition. And we have seen again during nine years of war but especially during these past 13 uh, months, how every attack on the battlefield, every missile attack was always sometimes paired and sometimes preempted by cyber attacks and by massive operation attacks. For us, this fight is existential. Hmm. Our lives depend on it, our freedom depends on it, our independence depends on it. So whether they publish something, they don't publish something, they come prepared, they come unprepared, there is only one way for us to defend our homes. So, and why did they, why would they publish something like this? Let's even, you know, speculate if they, if they got their hands on something uh, mm. that would be useful for them. If, if it's useful, you use it, right? But mm. to put it out there is clearly to, to again, try to break what I think has been a game changer during this phase of the war. That Ukraine and the West, all of us, I wouldn't even say the West, because we, the, our coalition of the willing is much wider. All the civilized people who believe in sovereignty, mm -hmm. territorial integrity, you know, the values on which the, the whole UN is founded, mm -hmm. that we all are together and we show unprecedented support to each other and other countries show big support to us, not only in the military domain, but in the sanctions front mm -hmm. and everywhere. So Russians failed to convince all of, all of the civilized people that they didn't attack. Hmm. They feel to convince that it's us to be blamed. Their only hope is to break this coalition. So they will try to do anything to put our relations, you know, like uh, between us and Europe, Europe and the US, uh, all of us together. And we just have to remember that. Do you think Ukraine needs to join the EU, join NATO? It's in our constitution, it's in our heart. The majority of Ukrainians believe that our future is in the European Union and in NATO. And I'm positive that we will be in both organizations uh, after we win. Do you have any interest in running for president? Me? Yeah. No. Why not? <laughs> I'm a financier, remember? <laughs> I've known some financiers who want to run for president sometime. Well, I'm, I think, you know, my president wants me to do a lot of uh, work here. There is still a lot to be done. And I also know that even after I was at the Ministry of Finance, I promised my family to spend more time with them. Uh, apparently, I didn't keep that uh, promise because uh, I was between the jobs uh, in normal private life, not for a long time, and then could not say no to my president to serve as an ambassador. 
So, um, so let me ask you finally, you know, this is written a finance question, but part of what comes on, I don't, I'm going to be quite candid around IMF World Bank meetings, lots of companies come around, we love the companies that come around and et cetera, but part of them are pursuing contracts around the world, part of them want to schmooze finance ministers. <laughs> and one of the interesting um, contests that I sort of feel brewing over Ukraine is between American firms and European firms that want to win the big contracts inside Ukraine post-conflict. Do you have a view on that? I'm gonna be talking later to a group tonight of American uh, companies that want to be involved in rebuilding and reestablishing Ukraine, but there's a little bit of worry that European firms may get uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a shoehorn in a little bit. So well, how do you balance that? Is it, you know, do, do U.S. firms, given all of the support the U.S. government has given Ukraine, do they get an edge over some of our European friends? Look, first of all, I think, you know, that uh, the renovation of Ukraine is going to be the largest construction or reconstruction project in Europe. Ukraine had the potential to be the fast, fastest growing economy even before that. When we win and we get into a full-scale rebuilding, we definitely will be uh, one of the fastest growing market. Now, with the major deregulation, our idea to leapfrog and build something innovative, there will be space for all the companies to participate there. Having said that, as the, our ambassador to the US, my KPI is to get as much American business as possible into, into Ukraine. That's why we're working so actively with DFC with Commerce Department, with Axiom Bank and others uh, working together with the administration to actually support the American business so they can start now. Because I think the more the, the businesses who will start now, not only the planning, but also thinking about uh, you know, going into the country and, uh, and we already learned how to get people relatively safe in and out. We have um, so many world leaders, including President Biden, who visited Kiev uh, during this time. So, um, you know, those are the, the, the companies that will have an edge and, and the priority in it. But, but frankly, again, in any sector you look, from agribusiness to tech, to financial sector, to manufacturing, to trade, Ukraine is going to be, for the lack of the better term, the new European tiger after we win. So this is the place to be. So I just want to uh, finish here. Um, Senator Joe Manchin and Senator Lisa Murkowski and Senator Mark Kelly visited Ukraine. It was announced today. Um, and Brad Paisley. Oh yeah, and Brad Paisley. That's right. Yeah, you've got you've got you've got better better information than I do. Um, I'm the ambassador. I know who who goes to. Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. So so there you go. Uh, anyway, I just I, I'm on, I'm a, I'm on the Manchin email list, so I got this. I mean, you knew it before I did. But um, how did the trip go? What are the takeaways? How important was this Senate trip from your perspective? Does it accomplish something that wasn't accomplished already? Every trip, and it was yet another bipartisan CODEL, is not only a great sign of bipartisan support, which we have and we need to have going forward, it's also very important to see these friends of Ukraine, but also sometimes new senators and congressmen and congresswomen come into the country to see it with their own eyes. It's not the same. I mean, it's one thing to, to see it on TV. It's another thing to go to you know, my hometown, go to Bucha and, and see it with your own eyes. It's very important. And they had excellent meeting with President Zelensky. Uh, you know, again, Brad Paisley played the song, sang a song right in the central square in Kyiv. It's something that Ukrainian people value a lot. Mm. We see how we became not only strategic partners with the U.S., how we always saw ourselves, but really strategic friends. And visits like this add to that strategic friendship. And finally, finally, finally. Um, I know you probably, well, I, you probably, I won't say I know, you probably have intelligence sources and even relationships given, you know, a historic connection between Ukraine and Russia from before about the decision making around Putin. Is there anything that gives you hope about a crack in the direction they're going? We can only count on ourselves. Look, 13 months of full-fledged war, nine years of since the war started in 2014, 
Unfortunately, even though we came from the same Soviet prison, mm. it, it's only a handful of people who fight against this in Russia, only a handful of people who say something against it. You know, but don't watch, but you saw the reports, you know, of this horrific, again, execution, brutal execution of our prisoner of war yesterday, not the first one. Who are these people, you know? So, you know, it would be nice to count on them somehow leaving, disappearing, and leaving us uh, uh, finally live in peace. But unfortunately, we never provoked and we never did anything to, to provoke this against us. So we can only count on us and our strategic friends, and we just have to liberate our territory within our recognized bodies. I will not say build a wall right after that, but literally, I mean, we, we pray that something happens, and uh, you know, maybe it's easier for us, but with Ukrainian luck, we will have to do it all ourselves. You know, the Washington Post, if all of you had and didn't see it, just did a really magnificent profile of the ambassador. And, you know, I had the privilege of being quoted in it. It was a great profile. But one of the things I said, you know, she's the prize at the DC party scene. And one of the things I said is, I know, but you'll notice, she never wants to be there. She doesn't want to be flamboyant. She doesn't want to be, you know, at, at parties and gatherings, but she wants people to get the message. I just want to say thank you for joining thank us you. at Semaphore. <laughs> ambassador Oksana Markarova. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. So listen, um, it's great to have the ambassador here. We're going to break, and Mike Froman is going to be on the way. We're going to you know, have a few words out there in the reception. We've got great cocktails. We've got, I think, is it Michelin star? Or, you know, I mean, I don't know. if we, we got really cool hors d'oeuvres and stuff. But listen, subscribe to Semaphore newsletters. We've got them on tech, finance, Africa, and there's a really good one called Principles. If you're not signed up for Principles, that's my daily newsletter. So thank you all very much. Give yourselves a round of applause for today. Thank you.